five years have passed. Five summers with the length of five long winters. And again, I hear these porters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild, secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild. These pastoral farms, green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees, with some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave, where, by his fire, the hermit sits alone. In these opening lines, Wordsworth basically sets the scene. He describes a place he's revisiting for the first time in five years, and he reminds us of that with the repetition of a game. So, from the beginning, at the same time as painting a picture of the scene with his words, Wordsworth involves himself in that scene, hearing the sound of the mountain springs, beholding the cliffs, reposing under a sycamore tree, viewing the cottages and the plots of land around them, and seeing the hedgerows, the farms, and the smoke rising here and there in the houseless woods. There's a strong sense of the visual here, of what the poet beholds and views and sees. But he also engages the sense of hearing, using it to create an atmosphere of peacefulness. The sound of the mountain springs is a soft murmur. The sky is quiet. The smoke rises in silence. But that sense of quiet peacefulness, reinforced by the fact that the poet reposes, rests under a tree, is counterbalanced by the lively activity of the rural scene. The waters of the spring are rolling. The scene is wild, the cliffs connect the land and the sky, the fruits are clad in green and lose themselves among the trees, the hedgerows run wild, the smoke is sent up. There's a lot going on. But all this activity takes place in seclusion. Wordsworth, like the hermit he imagines sitting in his cave, is alone. Together, this opening section of the poem expresses the poet's deep feeling of relief at being, after a gap of several years, once again away from human society, immersed in the world of nature, in which he finds a wealth of lively activity. But of course, there are other people in this picture. We can't see them, or at least Wordsworth doesn't mention them, but they must be there. And, explicitly indicative of human activity, there's the uncertain signal of the smoke. Wordsworth can only speculate about the origin of the smoke, perhaps a hermit alone in the woods by choice, or perhaps homeless vagrants. Modern criticism, with its emphasis on the historical and political context of literature, makes much of those vagrants. It's easy to suppose that in his imagined hermit, Wordsworth sees a kindred spirit, one who, like himself, seeks out the peacefulness of nature as a place within which to develop the spirit. But the vagrants open up more complex and in some ways more interesting lines of thought. In reality, the smoke would almost certainly have come from charcoal burning. But the area was also well known for vagrants. William Gilpin, in his Observations on the River Wye, published in 1782, but describing a visit made in 1770, talks about the poverty 
and wretchedness of vagrants living in the ruins of the Abbey itself, and numerous critics, Damien Walford Davies, Marjorie Levinson, Kenneth Johnston, Quentin Bailey, Robert Brinkley, David Chandler and others, have written about the political and ideological implications of Wordsworth's allusion to homeless vagrants in the woods near the Abbey. Speculating on possible allusions to Milton and the Civil War, or to Shakespeare and King Lear, and uh, to Britain's wars with France. But generally coming back to the idea that the vagrants, like the hermit, form a part of Wordsworth's image of himself. That he saw himself as part hermit, part vagrant, in relation to the society in which he lived. <laughs> These beauteous forms, through a long absence, have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. But oft, in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them, in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart, and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure. Such, perhaps, as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life. His little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Nor less, I trust, to them I may have owed another gift, of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended. We are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While, with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. Wordsworth often talks about how nature sustains him, not merely when he's out in the countryside experiencing it, but also when he's back in the world of cities and crowds of people. The opening lines of this second section of the poem are echoed in I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, where he lies on his couch in vacant or in pensive mood, and his heart fills with pleasure at the memory of those blooming daffodils. I much prefer the way he says it here. I get a lot more satisfaction out of his tranquil restoration as he remembers the beauteous forms of nature in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities than I do from the idea of his heart dancing with the daffodils. Maybe that's just me, but I don't think anyone could deny that he explores his feelings, his relationship with nature, far more profoundly here than in the poem on the daffodils. With that comment on the little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love, he makes an explicit connection between the world of nature and human nature. For him, responsiveness to the beauty of nature is a part of what makes a good person good. And he goes further even than that. It's almost like a meditation drawing us more and more deeply into itself as the poem leads us from uplifting memories and the impulse towards kindness into a serene and blessed mood that puts the body to sleep and animates the soul and we see into the life of things. He 
if this be but a vain belief. Yet, oh, how oft, in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan Y, thou wanderer through the wood, how often has my spirit turned to thee. This short section doesn't really seem to add very much. The poet's already told us how the rural landscape sustained him in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, and now he simply reiterates the point, couching it in slightly different language, with his spirit turning to the memory of the river while he is amid the fretful stir and the fever of the world basically just saying the same thing with different words. This tendency to prolixity, to droning on after he's made his basic point, is one of Wordsworth's faults. Seeing into the life of things is a powerful note, and I, I, I find myself almost wishing that he'd ended the poem here. His next thought will be that his present sojourn by the Y will provide life and food for his spirit in future years, just as it has done in the past, which is hardly an earth-shattering thought. And then he goes on to reflect on his youth and how his feelings towards nature have changed. And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint and, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a row, I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the course of pleasures of my boyish days, and their glad animal movements, all gone by, to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataracts haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colours and their forms were then to me an appetite, a feeling, and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past. And all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint I, nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such loss I would believe abundant recompense. I'm quite struck here by the idea that in his youth, the poet turned to nature more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Was there something in his life that he dreaded and which made him fly towards nature? Or did the mere act of flying towards nature arouse the feeling of dread in him? Whichever it is, he seems more to have been running away from something than towards something. What might it have been that he so feared? These lines were composed in 1798, and five years have passed, he says. So the poet's previous visit would have been in 1793. This was the year in which the French Revolution turned into the Reign of Terror. And I can't but feel that this is what Wordsworth's talking about here. In the prelude, he writes, 
Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. And, like many of the Romantic poets, he saw the French Revolution as a tremendous assertion of the human spirit. And here, I think, he refers obliquely to his misgivings as it turned into a bloodbath. Overall, though, I don't feel any great empathy with the poet in these lines. The aching joys and the dizzy raptures of the poet in his younger days don't really capture my imagination. I understand, but I'm not engaged. But just as I'm about to give up and conclude that the poem lost direction halfway through, Wordsworth surprises me. For I have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows, and the woods, and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, well pleased to recognise in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. The assuredness, the composure, the control here puts the lines leading up to it in a very different perspective. The poet intends us to feel distance from his younger self, just as he himself does. Those lines weren't meant to engage us. They were there to contrast with what follows, with the poet's present understanding of nature. Even so, if I'd been Wordsworth's publisher, I'd probably have been advising him to cut everything between we see into the life of things and for I have learned to look on nature. As for this section itself, much as I like it, it lays itself slightly open to ridicule with that word something. We've got all that build up a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something. Which feels like a bit of a letdown, a failure to exploit the power of words and language. Surely he could have found a better word. That isn't quite fair, because of course it isn't just something. It's something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and so on. This use of cataphoric reference, of defining something through what follows, rather than by what precedes it, is part of the resonance, part of the measured tone of these lines. Nor perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay. For thou art with me here, upon the banks of this fair river. Thou, my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister, and in this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her, tis her privilege, through all the years of this our life, to lead from joy to joy, 
For she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us, or disturb our cheerful faith, but all which we behold is full of blessings. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. And in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies, Oh, then, if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations? Nor, perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together, and that I, so long a worshipper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service, rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. Nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. At the beginning of this final stanza, Wordsworth kind of backtracks on what he's been saying so far. He's talked of nature influencing the best portion of a good man's life. He's called it the guardian of my heart and all my moral being. And now here he is apparently saying that it's not actually that big a deal. He'd still have been in good spirits, even if nature hadn't been his teacher, his guide, because, and this is the first we've heard of it, there's someone else there with him. It turns out he's with his sister. In her wild eyes, he sees something of what he used to be. Remember how he talked about his younger self in the previous section? Now he sees his sister as being like his younger self. I behold in thee what I was once. His prayer is that nature will be her teacher, teaching her to rise above all the dreary intercourse of daily life. And he supposes that like him, she will grow to love nature in a more reflective way, that her wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure. He goes on to say that even if he no more can hear his sister's voice, that is, presumably, if he's dead, even then he trusts that she will remember how they stood together on the banks of this delightful stream. He also wants her to remember that coming back to this beautiful place, the River Wye, after such a long time, he loves its steep woods and lofty cliffs all the more, both because of what they are, what they mean to him, and because she is there with him. Now, I'm going to give the thumbs down to this section. It has some good lines in it. I especially like Nature Never Did Betray the Heart That Loved Her, but it doesn't, in my view, add anything very much to what Wordsworth has already said, and indeed, by bringing his sister into the picture and emphasising how much she means to him, he actually undermines, to a certain extent, his panegyric to nature. I know his sister meant a lot to him. Uh, he married her best friend, Mary Hutchinson, in 1802, and the three of them lived together in the same house. And later on, when her physical and mental health began to fail her, he cared for her tenderly until his own death. At least, that's the standard narrative. 
It's worth noting, though, that Frances Wilson, in her biography, paints a different picture of a Dorothy who came into her own and enjoyed a new lease of life after her brother died. But Wordsworth isn't remembered today for how much he loved his sister. We remember him for what he wrote, and primarily for what he wrote about nature. He was a consummate observer of nature, often picking out the hidden details, the beauty that a less attentive person might have missed, and he expresses the mystical power of nature, its ability to heal our minds and awaken our compassion. What he says about his sister here is interesting, especially in the context of his life and his relationship with her, but to my mind at least, it isn't inspirational in the way that the descriptions of nature and its effect on his life are.